stand with us this morning?
your glory on our face we're looking to the sky descending like a cloud you're standing with us now lord That's our prayer this morning, that you would show your glory and your power to us, that this morning that we would come with open hearts and open minds, that we would allow your word to speak to our hearts, that, Father, that when we hear your word, that we allow it to, to make us uh, better followers of you, stronger followers of you. Father, there's people in here maybe this morning that do not have a relationship with you. God, I ask that you would open up the heavens so that they would see you, see your power and your glory and their need for you. God, we worship you. We praise you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and so glad to have you here at Lifehouse Church. My name is Kent Phoebus. I'm one of the pastors here and it's a... Uh, an honor to be here with you this morning. Um, and uh, on the way in, if you're a first-time guest, you may have received a, a first-time guest card. Uh, and it's just an opportunity for us to have a, um, a, a be able to know that we had some uh, guests here, people be here, uh, be uh, visiting with us. It's always exciting to look out. I can see people that I know. Um, sometimes you can't always see because of the lights, but there's people I know. And then I'm like, 
haven't seen that person for a little bit, or I haven't never seen that person, and I always wonder, I'm not pointing at particular people, by the way, that was just in general, all right, I saw people looking around, you know me, all right, um, but man, it's exciting to see uh, uh, new faces here, and uh, something that we like to do, we just have a card that we like to give to our new, uh, to our new guests, because and we just want to be able to have a chance maybe to reach out to you through email, through phone call, um, we just want to know, uh, want you to know that we're glad that you're here with us, and maybe if there's any questions you may have, uh, prayer requests that you may have, we want to be able to, to, uh, to reach out to you, and so if you are first-time guests, we have these ushers here that have a card, if you don't mind to slip up your hand right now, they're going to bring one of those to you, you can stick that in the offering basket uh, here in just a little bit when it's passed. But uh, if that's you, slip, slip your hand up and uh, they'll get one of those to you. Let's welcome the guests today with us, all right? Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Joel Miller and I'm the pastoral intern here at Lifehouse Church. This is the time of our service where we're going to celebrate communion. And real quick, just as we get started, just to explain how we do that here at Lifehouse Church is we will have four stations in the front and four stations in the back, two on each side. We'll have a gluten-free option at my far right, your far left, if you need that. And as you come down the aisles, please stay to the right, going and returning, just so we can uh, help control the flow a little bit better. And basically how we do it here is we take the bread, and we dip it in the cup, and then we eat. But I want to share with you 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 29. It's when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth concerning communion. And it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, for, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And I just want to pull out three very important things concerning communion from that passage. The first is remembrance. It says that as often as we do this, to do this in remembrance, of me in remembrance of Christ. This isn't a remembrance as if we lost our car keys or can't remember a phone number. This is remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Son of God, who came down from heaven to earth in the form of man, in the likeness of us. And he lived a perfect and sinless life and he died his body was broken and his blood was shed for us on the cross during the crucifixion. And he was buried and he rose again. Amen. Amen. And so when we remember, we remember and we feel, we think about these things. Remember the amazing work that Christ did, the amazing love that he showed us on the cross. And then the second thing is proclamation. God's word says that as often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we are proclaiming the gospel. We are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. But this proclamation isn't something that we do just once a month on a Sunday morning by taking communion. But it's something that we must do each and every day, each and every minute of our lives, proclaiming the Lord's death, proclaiming the good news of the gospel. Acts 1.8 says that we will be his witnesses here on this earth. So we proclaim the gospel through communion. And the last thing is self-examination. God's word says that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner is in danger of judgment 
against themselves. And listen, I want to be clear, apart from Christ, none of us are worthy to approach this table. It's only through Jesus. So what it means when it says in an unworthy manner is that if there is any unrepentant sin in our lives, if there's anything that we are holding on to when we're not being obedient to God in our lives, then that is a time when we should not come to the table until we've made things right, until we've confessed and repented from our sin. And maybe it's something between you and God or another believer or a family member, but the Bible is clear that your relationship with God is more important than even this table is, that we need to take care of that first and then come and eat. So this morning, I would challenge you to remember the Lord Jesus Christ as you eat the bread and as you drink of the cup or as you dip your bread in the cup as we do it here. And remember that you are proclaiming the gospel each and every time you do this. And it should be a reminder for us to proclaim the gospel when we leave these doors. And remember to examine yourself too because this is not something that we should do lightly. And also lastly, I just want to point out that this table is for believers. And what I mean by that is if you have not put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ, if you're here today and you are not a Christian, you've never called upon the name of the Lord for salvation, then we would simply ask that you abstain from this table today. And that is not at all to exclude you, but so that we might be obedient to the word of God, which we know that this is a table for believers, for those who have put their faith in Christ, who remember the Lord and who proclaim his death. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whom you so freely gave and poured out as a sacrifice, as an offering for our sin on the cross. And God, we remember his body, which was broken, and his blood, which was shed for us. And Lord, I pray that that would be something that we keep in remembrance in our lives each and every day, not just when we take communion, but that we might remember the great news, the good news, the gospel, every waking hour of our days. And God, I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage and that you would fill us with your spirit, that we might proclaim the gospel every minute of our days, whether it be by how we live or with our words as we go out into the communities that you have placed us in. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And it's in your name we pray, amen.
There's nothing stronger, there's nothing higher, there's nothing greater than the name of Jesus and all the honor, all the power, all the glory to the name of Jesus. There's nothing stronger. we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross so that we we may be forgiven of our sins to pay the penalty that we owed it's because of the cross that we can come today and remember through communion the sacrifice that Jesus made we're thankful for that it's in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. Right. you may be seated Good morning, LifeHouse. My name is Dave Banks, and uh, my family and I are partners here at LifeHouse. And now is the time where we continue our worship through our giving. And on the screen behind me, there's uh, many ways that uh, we allow you or enable you to give here at LifeHouse Church. Um, we don't want to be an obstacle in anything that you do. And so uh, whether it's traditional passing of the, uh, the baskets that will come here shortly or any technology means that you can think of, um, it's easy. There's a kiosk in the back or go online or text or if you can't figure it out, raise your hand and somebody will help you, I promise. So I've been asked to give a challenge on um, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 3. And just the title of this talk is called uh, Giving Should Be Planned and Systematic. So 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 1 through 3, Paul talks to the church in Corinthia and he says, Regarding the relief offering for the poor Christians that is being collected, you get the same instructions I gave the church in Galatia. Every Sunday, each of you make an offering and put it in safekeeping. Be as generous as you can. When I get there, you'll have it ready, and I won't have to make a special appeal. So what is Paul reasoning in this passage here? Really, Paul's commanding the Christians to give on a weekly basis. You know, in those days, uh, they were paid daily, Many of them were given a day wage, um, yet Paul told them, no, this is a planned giving. This is something you do on a weekly basis. He also says that greater efficiency and effectiveness results from giving in a planned and systematic way rather than haphazardly when a need arises. And in our ministry here at Lifehouse Church, many needs are ongoing. Needs such as missions. We'll hear a little bit more about that later. Feeding the hungry 
helping those in need here in our community. Just the simple or challenging running of day-to-day operations of our church. And as many of you know, it's a big plot of land down the road down there. So we'll say our build, building and land funds. So there's three observations that come from this text. First, Paul says that we're to give when? Every Sunday. This shouldn't be something that uh, we do when we get paid. This shouldn't be something that we do every now and then. This should be something that we do every single Sunday, a practice. And if you're thinking, well, maybe I don't have as much as somebody else, or maybe I'm just in a tough spot, none of us are let off the hook. If you're a Christian today, it says each of you should be doing this. So that none of us are exempt. We're all, all in on this. And last and probably the most important is to be as generous as you can. Many of us decide what that generosity level should be. I think that we should look to God and see what he's pushing us to do. Get out of our comfort zones a little bit. Um, Some people may think, well, I've never done this. I'm new. What's a good way to kind of get into the practice of giving, to be systematic or planned or focused or intentional? I think to uh, Dave Ramsey, who uh, does financial peace, and many here in the church have gone through that. And he gives a very simple example. He he always calls it, he gives financial advice like your grandmother would give you. So it's very basic and simple, but he calls it the envelope system. Where basically you have an envelope for your giving, an envelope for your saving, an envelope for your spending. And what that does is it causes discipline and it causes you to be intentional in what you do. It's a very easy, practical way to get into the practice of systematic giving. And I'd say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in sales, I'm in business. They always tell you if you're standing still, you're actually moving backwards. And decisions that you make are going to make, make an impact. They're either going to make a positive impact or a negative impact. So think through that when you're thinking about your giving. Every decision you make is going to make an impact on the kingdom. And so my call to action as we close is to think of these three questions. First, am I being a great manager of what God has entrusted to me? Second, am I using the funds that God has given me to invest in the kingdom to make eternal friends? And lastly, when we get to heaven, will there be anyone there to greet us and say to us, if it had not been for you and the investments that you made, I would not be in this amazing place. You are my forever friend. Let us pray. God, I ask that you would just be with us as we continue our worship through our giving. I ask that you would just challenge each of us to be more planned and systematic in what we're doing here, but not out of guilt and not out of obligation, but out of obedience and out of worship. God, this is a command that you give to us. You sent this message through Paul to the New Testament church, and you don't let any of us off the hook. And God, you ask us not to be just a little bit in, but you ask us to be all in for your kingdom. And I pray that today that we'll be all in in this area of our giving, in this area of our worship, and that you would bless these funds, Lord, just to further your kingdom, both here and our local community, but also around the world, that these funds invested today would invest in lives, and that one day later we'll get to meet our forever friends. We love you and we thank you, and we pray. Amen.
Good morning. I guess I don't need this. I have the, the headphone. <laughs> For those of you who are guests or visiting today, my name is Mark Lacey. I'm the lead pastor here at Lifehouse Church. We are so glad that you came to worship with us today. At this time, I'd like to make a special introduction. We have some special guests with us today. First, I'd like to introduce the Nunamaker family. They are missionaries in Haiti. Did I pronounce that right, Lee? Lee and his four boys and his wife. I'm sure there's some awesome wrestling matches at your house. You guys just look like wrestlers. And then we also, so we're so glad that you guys have come. They are missionaries in Haiti, and we partner as a church with a ministry called RMI, and that's the ministry that they are uh, sponsored by. And we're blessed to invest and be a part of what you guys are doing in, in Haiti. So glad that you guys have come. And we also have another family, a missionary family from Hawaii. How about that? Anybody want to go on a mission trip to Hawaii? I know, yeah, lots of hands. So maybe we should just do it. I, I don't know. Um, the Manley family have come, uh, Randy and Louise, and they're two girls and two boys, one of which is a missionary in Haiti, so you guys need to get connected. Um, but we are so blessed that you guys have come. Randy, this has been planned for some time. You're in for a treat. Randy is going to share a little bit about what God is doing in and through them in Hawaii, and then his girls, his wife and two daughters, are going to come and share a form of worship in Hawaii. You're going to be blessed. Randy, would you come and share? Well, let me say aloha. aloha. I did that with the kids, and I got to tell you, they did a whole lot better job than you guys did. Well, we are missionaries uh, to Hawaii, in Hawaii. We've been there for 22 years now, and uh, we, it's always good to get back and reconnect with people. But let me tell you a little bit uh, about Hawaii. But before I do, let me, let me see what some of your pre- conceived ideas of Hawaii are. What do you think of when you think of Hawaii? Surf, yeah, of course. Maybe you think of big waves. <clears throat> Our waves get really big. Last winter we had some waves somewhere between 30 and 40 feet. Um, so we were at the beach in Delaware uh, last weekend. <laughs> we'll just leave it right there. Maybe when you think of why you think of one of the world's most recognizable beaches, and that's Waikiki. And uh, it's a beautiful place, a lot of tourists. Uh, maybe when you think of Hawaii, you think of these guys up here. Huh? Either the remade version or the old version from a while ago. Uh, don't admit that if you know those guys. Or maybe you just think of paradise. Maybe you think of just a place to kind of get away and lay on a beach and enjoy life. And Hawaii is all of those things. Um, God has called us to the island of Molokai. And if you look at a map, you'll notice there are five major islands. Molokai is the island right in the middle. To our north is the island of Oahu with the city of Honolulu. To our south is the island of Maui. We sit right in the middle. We are neither Oahu or Maui. We are totally just Molokai. We uh, are 38 miles long, 14 miles wide in the widest area. Perhaps you've heard of Father Damien. Father Damien was uh, a Catholic missionary to lepers in a leper colony on our island, the, uh, the uh, peninsula of Kalapapa. And... Um, so we are, we are known for leprosy. Um, hopefully we're known for some other things. But if you've gone to Hawaii, you probably didn't go to Molokai. You, uh, you probably flew right over or next to it, and they told you, oh, there's the island of Molokai. We don't get a whole lot of tourists. Um, we have no Walmart. We have no McDonald's. We have no stoplight. We have two gas stations two small grocery stores about the size of 7-Eleven, and um, we have a whole lot of beaches, a whole lot of fun. But we also have a whole lot of people with a whole lot of problems. Can you relate to that? Say, wait a minute, it's paradise. How can you have people with problems? Because wherever you have people, you have problems. Maybe you've noticed that here in Delaware. Our biggest uh, problem on the island from the standpoint of crime is domestic violence. We have a huge meth problem. We call it ice over in the islands. We have a huge need 
for foster homes because families, even though you've seen in the Disney movies all about Ohana, Ohana is talked about, but it's not practiced very well. Real similar to here, I think. See, God has called us to Molokai. We're missionaries. A missionary is simply a person on mission. And our mission is to people. And the reality is, you're all missionaries too if you've trusted Christ as your Savior. He's called you on mission. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. That word reconciliation is a great word. In the original, it means to exchange. See, I shared aloha with you when I started. Aloha comes from two words, alo in the presence of, and ha, life, in the presence of life. I love the name of your church, Life House. You and I have been called to this message of reconciliation, the message of exchange. See, God says something like this. I want to make an exchange. You give me your brokenness. You give me your sin. You give me your pain. I'll give you life. That's what God's called us to on the island of Molokai. That's what he's called you all here to in this part of the world. And we are so thankful for your church. I don't know your pastor very well, but I see his heart. Follow this man as he follows Jesus, and you will see people come to life. I'm going to ask my girls to come up. They're going to share with you some of our culture. The hula was birthed, tradition tells us, on the island of Molokai. So Molokai is a very sacred place to the Hawaiians. Originally, uh, traditions and history were passed down orally, and the hula was very important in that. Eventually, it became a part of the worship of false gods, but several years ago, as uh, Hawaiians were coming to Christ, they began to take the culture and allow God to redeem it. And God has redeemed the hula, and we can use it today for worship. And the girls are going to show you. And they're dancing to a song called The Prayer. And it is our prayer that you continue to be a true house of life here in Delaware.
Isn't that cool? So cool. Thank you guys, Louise and Randy and girls, for sharing your hearts and for worshiping with us here in Delaware. And I don't know about you, I mean, we do have a Walmart and we do have a McDonald's, but I'll take 30-foot waves over a Walmart and McDonald's any day. Lifehouse Church, did you appreciate their ministry? I know you did. Thank you so much for coming. Please turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 as we continue our journey verse by verse through the 11 first chapters of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. We're going to look specifically this morning at chapter 2 verses 4 through 25 and what we will find there is not a contradicting or conflicting account of God's creation of man. You might say, we already talked about God's creation of man. That's recorded in Genesis chapter 1 and yes it is. But what we're going to find here is a clarifying account, going into more detail of what has already been communicated. In much the same way as I may have a uh, conversation with someone about my weekend, about my Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and tell them on Friday, you know, that was a work day for me. I did chores. I mowed the grass. Saturday for me was a day of preparation and prayer. And Sunday, man, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into into the house of the Lord. So I summarized my weekend. And then, in a subsequent uh, conversation, someone may ask, well, why were you glad when you went to the house of the Lord, when you went to church on Sunday? And so I may go into more detail and say, well, on Sunday, I went to Lifehouse Church. I gathered with my family in Christ at Lifehouse Church, Everett Meredith Middle School, 504 South Broad Street in Middletown, Delaware. And twice, at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., we sang our hearts out to God. We had an awesome missionary family from Hawaii come and share a form of worship that they do in Hawaii. And I preached a sermon on God's creation of man. And I, I would hope to be able to tell them, man, and what was so awesome, when all was said and done, at the end of the service, someone got saved. A man and a woman or men and women called upon the name of Jesus, believing in him, repenting of their sins and turning to him to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Man, that would be the icing on the cake. If that happened, I would be happy and they would be happy. We'd all be happy. We'd all be glad, would we not? And again, so that wouldn't be a contradicting account. It would be a different, more detailed, clarifying account. And really, that's the idea of the relationship between Genesis chapter 1 and specifically day 6 and God's creation of man. And here, Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25. Again, not contradicting, but rather clarifying what has already been communicated in this passage of Scripture. Just to kind of give you a heads up of what I hope and pray you will see is that when it comes to God's divine design of man, according to his divine design, first I hope that you'll see that his divine design of man is particular and precise. And again, this complements what's already been communicated. If you'll remember, we're told that God uniquely created man in his own image. Male and female, specifically, there's particularities there. There's specifics there. He created them and God blessed them. Second, my prayer is that you'll see that God's divine design of man involves purpose and prohibition. You'll see prohibition there. God communicated already to us that man was to bear fruit and to multiply. Men were to have dominion, not just to simply sit back and enjoy creation, not just to simply be fed and be catered to. Man was never, as we see in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, never meant to simply be a consumer, to consume. We get clarification of that in Genesis chapter 2. And then finally, we're informed in Genesis chapter 2 in more detail that according to God's divine design of man, it includes plurality and partnership. Male and female, he created them. There's plurality there. There's two. Two are better than one. And then furthermore, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So particular and precise purpose and prohibition and plurality and partnership. And listen, I'll just give you a heads up, and I hope I'm not going to disappoint anybody, but I will not be talking about how Peter Piper picked a peck of pip- pickled peppers. <laughs> I know there's already a lot of peas, but we'll leave it with these peas. Is that all right? I'm sure it's okay. Let's pray before we dive into Genesis chapter 2. Father God, we believe that your word is true that you are who you reveal yourself to be in your holy word. You are Elohim, God Almighty. And so, Lord, we look to you and we ask you to do what only you can do. And I pray that as your word is proclaimed, that we would be a people that responds in obedience to your word. 
in such a way that would bring you glory, that would be worshipful to you, that we today, what takes place, I know that a lot of things have already taken place and it likely was a fragrant aroma to you. May how we respond to your word as individuals and as a people be a blessing to you. May it be considered by you as worship. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So again, let's dive into Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 4. And first we'll see, what I hope we'll see and you'll see, is that God's divine design of man is both particular and precise. In verse 4, we're told, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When they were created, in the day, in other words, way back in time, that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens Verse 5, during this day, this time in that day when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not yet caused it to rain on the land and there was no, at this time, man to work the ground. And rather a mist, or that could also be translated a spring, was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the earth. Verse 7, then. At that time, in this day, the Lord God formed the man. From the dust of the ground, he formed the man. And then he breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life. And the man, and this is Adam. When God breathed into Adam, the first man, he became a living creature. Now again, what we're told here in Genesis chapter 2 is not conflicting with the fact that God made man on day six or with the fact that on day three, as already has been communicated in Genesis 1.11, that God spoke, he said, let the earth sprout forth vegetation. That all happened, plants yielding seed and trees bearing fruit. That happened on day three. But this, what we're reading in Genesis chapter two is clarifying what happened on day six. And at this time, we're told that on that day, day six, when God created man, and we can get way technical, we don't have time to this morning, the long and the short of it is that when this all began, when the generations, man and women, began, this is before sin entered the picture. Way back in the day when the effects of sin and the consequences of sin that Moses, who wrote this, and the people who were receiving this at first knew all about at that time, and what we know all about at this time all too well, We read about that in Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, when man sinned and sin entered the picture and messed all that was very good and made it not very good. And that will be addressed in detail next week and in the days that follow. But what happened was when man sinned, the ground was then cursed. The result of man's sin was that it was cursed. And God told man that thorns and thistles, it, the ground, shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field and you're going to work the ground. The sweat of your face, by the sweat of your face, shall you eat bread. In other words, the result of your sin, as a result, you will have to work the ground and you will know the bush of the field and the plant of the field, that, which is referred to in Genesis chapter 2. When God created man, it was before all that. I think of Genesis, or excuse me, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, when it says that he who sows seed to the flesh, in other words, he who sins shall of the flesh reap corruption. And understand, brothers and sisters, that that corruption, the result of when we sin and sow seed to the flesh, that corruption that we're promised will happen will not be isolated or contained to ourselves. It will continue to spread. And that's what happened when man sinned. In Genesis chapter 3, corruption continued to spread. The effects and consequences of sin continued to spread. And that's what was being referred to here. Those consequences were the bush of the field, the plant of the field, and man had to work. It was all fruit of sin and even rain. Did you know that the first time it rained on the earth was when it rained for 40 days and 40 nights in Noah's day? Before that, the the mist sprang up, or spring sprang up and watered the whole face of the earth, but it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Why? Because God was not okay with the corruption, the result of sin that continued to spread from the time of Adam and Eve. God had had enough of the sin, and so that he wiped it all out. He was not okay with the sin, and so he caused it to rain. That's when rain started. And Moses said, in the time, way before the rain came, Way before the bush of the field and the plant of the field and man were caused to to sweat, then at that time, God created man. 
This would be like me telling my kids if they came to me and asked me, tell us about when it all started for us, when our family began. And I would say, listen, it was way a long time ago before gray hair started or or was seen on my head. And my kids don't know me without gray hair on my head. That's why I go really short on the the side. It's there, believe me. I'd say, yeah, it started for us way back when I didn't even have to think about diet food. I could just eat pizzas and Big Macs, all those things at McDonald's, and not even have to worry about it. This was, our family started when minivans, and can you believe it, kids? I mean, we've had minivans all through our kids' lives. We thought we would never own a minivan. It was way before minivans when all, all the things started for us, when our life started. And kids, when it started for us, believe it or not, cats were not even in the picture. <laughs> They were other people's problems in that day that I met your mom. So again, back to Genesis, before sin entered the picture and the effects of sin and the consequences of sin. Verse 7 says, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. The Lord God Almighty, Yahweh Elohim. And the use of that specific title, Yahweh, communicates a covenant relationship. He's Yahweh, has a covenant relationship. He loves his people. And the word formed there is not just he formed as any, he put together and threw something together. No, that specific word means there's intentional design, just like an artist would create a masterpiece. It's like a sculptor forming or a potter forming a work of art. The Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, formed man. And the Lord God breathed into man, into his nostrils. And again, right there, there's a sense of intimacy. Man was face to face with Yahweh Elohim. And God breathed his breath, his own breath into man, the breath of life. We're not told that God did that with any of the other animals, the beasts of the field or the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. We're not told that he did that. We're told that he spoke and vegetation sprouted up. God breathed his breath into man and by doing so gave him a life. Brothers and sisters, the divine design of man we see clearly as clarified in Genesis chapter 2 is particular and it is precise. It is not happenstance. It is not arbitrary. It is uniquely special. God said, let us make man in our image. And in verse 8, the reality is further reinforced that the Lord God did it, that it's particular and precise and that God had the special place in his heart for man and mankind. God didn't just create man, breathe life into his nostrils and then go about his, his way. He did not move on to bigger and better things. Rather, the Lord God, we're told, planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put, in order, he placed specifically the man whom he had formed like an artist, forms a work of art, a masterpiece. Understand here clearly as it relates to your life, that God did not allow the man to find a place that suited him best. Man was put in the place that God prepared uniquely, specifically, particularly for him. And that's what the divine design of man involves. Verse 9, and the ground, this place, therefore the man, the Lord God, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So again, this is before the bush of the field and the plant of the field. That's a result of sin. Here, every tree at this time that God sprouted forth from the earth was pleasant to the sight. It was good for food. And that we're told that the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. And furthermore, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is also in the midst of the garden. We'll learn more about those trees in the weeks that follow. But the picture painted for us here through Moses' words is that the Lord God put man in a place that was thriving, in a place that was flourishing and that was good and it was abundant. It was a particular and a precise place for the man he formed in his own image and in his own likeness, into whose nostrils he breathed his own breath, the breath of life. And this place was prepared and it was beautiful and it was pleasant to the sight and it was flowed and it was overflowing, we're told. Verse 10 says that literally overflowing, waters were flowing, rivers flowed out of Eden to the water, to water the garden, and there in the garden, it divided, it became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon, and it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and Delam and Onyx stone are there. 
The name of the second river is the Gihon, and it's the river that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. See that God's divine, as you look at this passage, it is specific. It is particular. God had a specific place, and it was an awesome place. It was abundant. That's what God wants for his people. Remember what Jesus says in John 10, 10, I have come, I am here that you might have life, not just life, abundant life. God wants us to thrive in him. That's his plan for us, his particular and specific plan. He created you. He knows you. He wires you. You are his masterpiece. And he wants you to live the abundant life that he has planned for you. The question is, will you? Brothers and sisters, will you be who God created you to be? Will you do what he has commissioned you to do and find joy in doing so? Here we see this play out as God created the first man. He put him in a specific place, an abundant place. See that God's divine design of man is particular and it is precise. And the same affection that God had clearly is communicated in how we created Adam. He has for you. Brothers and sisters, he knows your name. Scripture tells us that he knows the number of hairs on our head or lack thereof for some of us. Number of gray hairs too, I'm sure. He knit you together in your mother's womb, we are told. He didn't just throw you together. He designed you. He does not make mistakes. Whether someone else tells you or someone else thinks that it doesn't matter, God does not make mistakes. And just like he prepared a place for Adam, he prepares a place for you. His divine design of man and of you is particular and precise. And furthermore, the next thing we see starting in verse 15 is that it includes purpose and prohibition. We're told that the Lord God took the man and he put him, placed him in the Garden of Eden, not just to sit back, kick up his feet, enjoy the 30-foot waves. No, to work it and to keep it, to cultivate it. There's responsibility communicated here. And man was not to be burdened by this work. Man was created for this work. He was to be blessed and filled up as he poured himself out with this work. And so it is with us as we build the kingdom, as we work and cultivate it and do and use the gifts that God has placed within us. We find no greater joy, I'm telling you, I have found personally no greater joy than when I pour myself out for him and to experience him filling me back up and giving me strength and wisdom and experiencing and knowing him in deeper and greater ways. He wants you to know him. He wants you to experience his power, his equipping, his divine design in your life. He knows you, brothers and sisters. Are you, will you be the man and men and women of God that he has created and designed you to be? for his glory and for your good. God put the man in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Again, see here that he's never created man to simply be consumers. We live, this is hard for us to understand because we live in a consumer-oriented culture and this bleeds into even the church, evangelical Christianity, even though the Bible speaks against it that we're to live on mission. As was already said, we have a purpose We are not supposed to just simply attend or be members. No, Ken always says you can have a gym membership, but you don't have to use it. No, we call it partnership at Lifehouse Church because we want you to be a part of what God is doing. We want you to experience him in ways that you would not otherwise using your gifts alongside your brothers in conjunction with your brothers and sisters and be blessed in the process. You have a purpose. We, the church, have a purpose. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But listen, the man was meant, put in the garden to work it and keep it for a purpose. And then we see this odd prohibition. Lots of questions surrounding this prohibition. In verse 16, starting in verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, and understand, underline, highlight, there are commands in Scripture, all right, brothers and sisters? Not suggestions, not things for us to consider. There are commands in Scripture communicated to us By Elohim, almighty God. And so when we approach scripture and we consider scripture, we need to understand the word command. It's not suggestion. Here the Lord commanded the man, not because he wanted to burden the man, not because he wanted to beat the man up or for the man to be miserable, because he loved the man. He commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. See the generosity of our God there. 
eat of any tree here, all these trees that are pleasant to the eye and good for food. But, verse 17, here's the prohibition of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Listen, God's divine design of man includes purpose and it includes prohibition. And now there are countless commentaries and debates arguing why would God place this tree in the garden? Why would God put a tree like that in the garden? Why would God withhold? I mean, this sounds like a good thing. Why would he not want his children, the people that he loves, to know what the difference between good and evil? What's this about? And truly much can be said and debated and commentated. But as I meditated on this passage this week and considered all these questions that I have, what I see here with this prohibition, what surprised me as I meditated on it, is an opportunity for man to worship. The word used earlier for work is also used, the, the, the Hebrew word is also used to describe service for God. So that in a sense is worship. But here in this prohibition, God telling him not to eat of this one tree. He gave him everything he needed. Enjoy it. Live abundantly. Thrive in this garden. But just don't eat this one tree. This is an opportunity for worship because through obedience, brothers and sisters, this was an opportunity for a man Adam and Eve to express in a tangible way, God, I love you and God, I trust you. God, I don't understand why you don't want me to eat of this tree. I may not understand, but I want to be obedient to you because I believe that you are true, that your ways are higher than my ways, that you've given me dominion, but ultimately you are in charge, that you are uh, Yahweh Elohim. And so regardless of why, I'm just going to be obedient. And in a sense, by being obedient, not doing what you have commanded me not to do, God receives that as worship. You often hear me talk about the Apostle Paul. I love it. I tell you, if you want to know what true worship is that goes beyond singing lip service, look at the Apostle Paul's life as communicated through the New Testament. He was obedient the Apostle Paul always went where he was sent. The Apostle Paul always did what God called him to do, even when it didn't make sense, amen, even when it involved sacrifice, amen, even when it involved suffering. And Paul was so blessed and so joyful in his service, his worship to God, even from a prison cell, he said, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. He had joy. And even in a prison cell, the apostle Paul, because he was worshiping God there through obedience, declared, and we know that he would not rather, he wouldn't want to be in any other place because he was right where God wanted him to be, obedient. And he knew that that blessed his father God. Yahweh Elohim. And so it was worship. That's true worship. 24-7. He says in Romans 12-1, you know what your reasonable worship is? In light of who God is, in light of what Jesus has done on the cross, he says, I urge you, because he wants the best for the people that he's communicating to in Romans, he says, I urge you, I beg you to offer your body, all of yourself as a living sacrifice this is what's acceptable. This is what is appropriate in light of who God is and what he's done. Not your toe dipping in the water, not part of yourself, all of yourself, your body. And again, this was so that they would be blessed. He wanted them to find what he had experienced and what he knew himself. Obedience, true obedience, wholehearted obedience, not delayed obedience. True obedience is worship. And that's what this prohibition is all about through this prohibition, man had the opportunity to express, God, I trust you. God, I love you. Kind of as a different perspective, isn't it? I command my kids to do a lot of things. I prohibit them from doing a lot of things only because I love them. Only because I want the best for them. The same can be said of how God in his perfect divine design for man includes in his perfect creation a prohibition. And that's the idea here in Genesis chapter 2. He says, it's all yours. You may surely eat of every green tree of the garden, all of it. Simply do not eat this one. And obeying me, worship me. And unfortunately, they ate of that tree. We know Genesis chapter 3. We ate that apple, that forbidden fruit. It wasn't really an apple but that forbidden fruit, and it caused death. 
But I don't believe it was the fruit that caused death. It was their disobedience that caused death. We're told in the New Testament the wages of sin is death. And that's what happened when they ate the fruit. And not simply you will know evil cognitively, but you will experience evil. It will be a part of you. You will know and experience evil in a way that I don't want you to experience. I want the best for you. Death, evil's not the best for you, so don't eat the fruit. Obey me. Don't eat it. It's for your good. And express worshipfully, God, I love you. God, I trust you. Remember what Jesus says in the Gospels? If you love me, and listen, we throw that around in our culture a lot, don't we? I love Jesus. We sing our lungs out, the top of our lungs. I love you, Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Jesus says, you want to know in the New Testament, in the Gospels, he says, you want to know who my true disciples are? Because there's a lot of, listen, there's nothing new under the sun in Jesus' day and in our day. A lot of people say, I follow Christ. I'm a Christian. That's what Christian means. I follow Christ. I believe the gospel. I believe in Jesus. But Jesus says, you want to know who my true disciples are? Those who obey my commandments. Jesus confronted the Pharisees who were all about talking about how much they love God. He said, you honor me with your lips but your hearts are far from me. You're not a true follower, a true disciple. And unfortunately, brothers and sisters, that is true. Our churches in evangelical America are inundated with like-minded people that don't obey Jesus. And therefore, according to Jesus, they don't really love Jesus. But I'm telling you, to know Jesus is to love Jesus. And if you know Jesus and you believe that he is the Son of God and that his word is true and that his words are life, then you will obey his commands and you will do what he wants you to do if you really believe it and you will not do what he tells you not to do. It's true worship. That's God's divine design. It's particular, precise. It's purposeful and There's a prohibition. And then finally we see that God's divine design of man involves plurality and partnership. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, Yahweh Elohim said, he declared, it is not good that man, the man that I formed should be alone. And listen, I get this. My wife has been away with the kids for the whole week. I'm by myself. It is not good that man should be alone. It was that way from the beginning. And he says, because it's not good for the man that I formed, that I created uniquely and specifically, it's precise and particular, I will make a helper fit for him. Understand, helper here does not mean subordinate or slave or assistant or apprentice. This is not about a hierarchy or or a chain of command here. God made him a helper. And this same term God used and is used for God himself as the helper of his people in the Old Testament. Remember what Jesus called the Holy Spirit? The helper, this is a good thing. This is an honoring thing. Jesus said, if you remember, it's to my advantage that I go, that he was talking about being ascended into heaven. It says, to your advantage that I go and that the helper will come and this helper will guide you into all truth. He'll help you be the man and the woman, the men and women that I've called you to be and he will help you do what I am commissioning you to do. And that leads us to the great commission. Go and make all disciples. We have a purpose, believers. So that's the idea of helper here. Verse 19, now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every birds of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. Again, man enjoyed responsibility here, enjoyed dominion at this time. Verse 20, and the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Remember, this was all still on day six. This was before day seven. Benjamin Hankin preached last week about the day of rest. This is before that. This is clarifying what happened on day six. This was at the time when God, creation was not very good. Creation at this point was not very good because it was not complete. There was still yet to be made, built rather, because that's the word made, Built specifically is the more literal translation of the word. When God said, I will make a helper fit for him, I will build a helper fit for him. Remember that because we're going to get to that in a moment. A helper suitable for Adam. Clearly nothing. I mean, he had named all the animals. He saw nothing was good enough. And so God particularly and precisely made a helper. Verse 21, so the Lord God 
Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of the, the man's ribs, and he closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Picture this. This is a presentation, and I can see the smile on God's face. Remember, this is an artist unveiling his masterpiece to his masterpiece. What joy he found in bringing this woman, his creation that he built specifically for him, with him in mind, this helper. Can you see the smile on God's face? Can you see the smile on the man's face? Adam's face when God brought this woman Eve to him. This is like the father walking his bride down the aisle about to present him to the groom. God is smiling. The man is smiling. Eve is smiling. And then the man said, verse 23, and he proclaimed, listen to the joy. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Again, remember God's divine design is precise and particular. And we see purpose too. She had a job to do as his helper. He wasn't just to, to do all the work to work and she was to sit back. No, she was to help him. They were partners, co-laborers. And you can hear Adam's joy, his excitement. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This is our God. He wants us to be blessed, not burdened down and weighed down. Remember what Ben preached about last week, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Or, or, yeah, eleven twenty eight, where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for you will find rest for your souls. No good thing will God withhold from those who love him. Paul said to Corinthians, again, a guy who worshiped God by his light, even though he suffered much, sacrificed much, went through a lot, he said, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man. Imagine the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Nothing. Those who obey God, he blesses. Those who worship God, God shows up. You want to see God's glory? Worship him, obey him. One example I can't dismiss is that of Malachi chapter 3. And listen, I reinforce this. We talk about giving here because we believe it's important because not because we want to bleed people dry. And no, we're not all about money. We're about the mission that God's called us to be a part of. And I want my kids, my family, my church family to be blessed. And God communicates through his prophet Malachi in chapter 3. Test me in this. Obey me in this. Bring the full tithe into storehouse. Do it. And see, you watch if I don't bless your socks off, paraphrase, Mark. See, see if I don't. If you bring the full tithe, not part of the tithe, the full tithe in the storehouse, see if I will not pour down blessings upon you. See if your barns are not full and overflowing and thriving, just like we're talking about here in the Garden of Eden. God blesses obedience. And this is the one time Malachi chapter 3, he says, test me in this. It's the one time in scripture that we are invited to test God. He will bless you. God blesses obedience. God brought the woman to the man and the man said, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to cling to his wife and they shall become one flesh, united, no division on the same team, not unequally yoked, not with different agendas, not going in different directions. No, one flesh with eyes and hearts and minds on the same person. That is God himself, Yahweh Elohim. And verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? Because, again, this is before sin entered the picture. They had nothing to hide. At this time, they had not been disobedient. And so there was nothing between them and God. God hates sin, and that's when they were ashamed because of their sin. But at this time, sin had not entered the picture. All was well. Men at this time and women were free to worship. They were not ashamed. Nothing was holding them back, no scars, no stains, nothing to deal with or examine before they take communion, even though they didn't take communion at that time. But that's the idea. They were not ashamed, clean, pure. Are you, brothers and sisters, washed in the blood of Jesus? Are you obedient? Do you love God? Do you trust him? Do you worship him? Paul, who was obedient, washed in the blood of Jesus, he wasn't perfect. 
He shares his testimony about all the things that he did before he came to Christ. But in obedience, doing what he was called to do, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. Paul was obedient. Jesus says, whoever's ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of him. Adam and Eve at this time in Genesis 2 had nothing to hide. They were naked and not ashamed. Unfortunately, that too changed when sin came into the picture. But we see, again, in closing, wrapping this up, God's divine design of man involved a particular and a precise design. It involved purpose and a prohibition for the glory of God and for our good, and then also includes plurality and partnership. And as we close, again, there are a million and one applications to this passage. A million and one. We don't have time to go through all of them. But I feel led specifically to focus on what one implication specifically and what it means for the church. All these principles relate to us as a church, a body of Christ. Eve was Adam's bride, his helper, created to be one with him, one flesh. And they, Adam and Eve, together in plurality were to live out their purpose. Together they were to worship, obey God together as a unit, as one flesh. And this application really hit me when I was studying Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, where we're told that God said, I will make a woman for the man in the Hebrew language. Remember that original word, or more literally is, I will build a woman for the, work, for the man. And I couldn't uh, dismiss What Jesus boldly declares, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so in light of this, I can't remember or I can't help but remember the words of Jesus. God said, I will build for the man a woman. And Jesus said, I will build my church. I can't help but realize that Eve was Adam's bride and we are as the church clearly communicated in scripture time and time again. We are the bride of Christ. And how we as the church are to be one body, many members, but one body. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. No, we all have a purpose. God places each of us within the body, just like God placed man in the the garden. And we're there in the church, within the church, corporately, with plurality, serving and company. Uh, using our gifts as individuals with others, we're to thrive in that place. We're to live the abundant life that Jesus talks about in John 10.10. I couldn't help but remember as I read this passage how God breathed life, his breath, into the nostrils of man and how God, thinking about Acts chapter 2, when the church was born, how God breathed his spirit, his spirit fell upon The church, what became the church, what came to life is the church that very moment when God breathed his spirit on them. And just like Adam had obviously had an affection for the woman, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Forget not Ephesians 5.25 where we are told that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. This is God's divine design, and it involves particularity and precision. It involves purpose and prohibition. Ephesians 2.10 says that each of us, we are God's workmanship. Remember, God formed the man like an artist forms a work of art. In Ephesians 2.10, it says the same thing. For us who believe when we are saved by grace through faith, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So there's the precision, there's the particularity, but then we have a purpose in Christ Jesus for good works, for a purpose. We have a mission. We have gifts that he's placed within us that are to be used in conjunction with other people other brothers and sisters in Christ. And that purpose is explained in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, the great commission where we together corporately are to go into all the world. We're to do and use our gifts to accomplish this greater mission, Jesus's mission, his agenda. I love what Pastor Randy shared about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, how we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's our mission. That's our purpose as believers. And that goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, today, brothers and sisters, understand today is the day of salvation. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1, it says, do not receive this grace of God. In other words, the fact that there is opportunity to be saved today, don't receive this grace of God in vain. In other words, tomorrow may not be the day of salvation. Today is. So make the most 
of today. Be who God's created you to be today. Use your gifts, your resources today with your brothers and sisters to do what God has commissioned and commanded, commanded you to do. And there's a prohibition in scripture about not being a part of the church. Hebrews 10.25 says, just like God said, do not eat the forbidden fruit. In Hebrews 10.25, he says, do not forsake the assembly, the coming together. And even more as the day, that day when salvation will not be a possibility draws near. Brothers and sisters, we are all called to be a part of the church and it involves plurality. Iron sharpens iron. We're to bear one another's burdens together and so fulfill the law of Christ. And in summation, think about what our mission is. Remember the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17? He prayed, O Lord that they, referring to us, the church today, those who would believe after the disciples, that they, oh God, Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, oh, that they would be one. Not some over here doing their thing, not some over here doing their thing. Oh, that they would be one. And he didn't say so that they can just have a party and everyone could be happy. No, for a purpose. He said, oh, that they would be one so that the world may believe the lost and dying world around them the people that God loves that he wants to have a relationship with that they might be saved that they would see the unity and that there would be strategy and effectiveness in that unity and they would accomplish more in that unity that oneness that was meant that one flesh that one body under the direction of Jesus Christ so that they can accomplish more oh this is Jesus prayer not my prayer oh that they may be one so that the world may believe Consider this, brothers and sisters, as we close. Again, there's a million and one applications to this passage of Scripture. Individually, listen, you can read this, and God can speak to you where you are in your life as an individual. Obviously, because there's the marriage portion. He can speak to you in your marriage, and there's a lot of broken marriages represented in this room in this ministry. There's a whole lot out that door. There's a lot of application there, but there's also application clearly, and this is what God's spoken to me when I prayed about what he would want me to preach, the application is to us as the church. The reality is, church, and two things that I just want to close with for you to consider and pray about. One is I want you to know that when you serve here at Lifehouse Church, when you use the gifts that God has given you, that he placed within you, he knit you together, he formed you, he created you in Christ Jesus, Four good works that you should walk in him. That's the truth. They're there. Whether you think they're there or not, they are there. When you serve and you use those gifts, it makes a difference. And when you give and you invest in the kingdom through this ministry and what God is calling us to do, I want you to know it makes a difference. God uses your investments and your services to build the kingdom. And it encourages us together. But I also want you to know that when you don't give and when you don't serve, it makes a difference. The laborers are few. God is at work here. No one can deny that. But the reality is, especially because of our culture, and listen, I want people to go on vacation. I do. I'm going tomorrow. Praise God. It is not good that man should be alone. I'm ready to be with my wife and family on vacation. You should go on vacation. You should rest. Rest is appropriate. It's God honoring. But I'm telling you, our culture is really breathing into this situation. And so many people check out in a way that creates such a big burden. Our volunteer coordinator, Michelle Cooksey, God bless her. She works so hard, and if you could hear the phone ringing through the week and the cancellations, the texts that she gets, and listen, I'm not saying don't go on vacation, and my heart is not to guilt anyone or to manipulate one. I want you to serve, and I want you to be blessed in serving, but I'm telling you, we need you. When you serve, it makes a difference. When you don't serve, it makes a difference, and we need you so that we can do what God has called us to do as the church so we can be what God has called us to be as the church so that the world around us may believe the men and women that we love, our neighbors, our family, the kids that our 
kids go to school with, who are lost and dying and going to hell. They need the church to be the church, the hands and feet of Jesus, and to proclaim the gospel. That's what God has called us to do, to be this ministry of reconciliation. We need you, so please prayerfully consider not putting it off till summer is over, but if you're available, listen, God wants your, not ability, your availability. Please come alongside us and be the church with us. We need you, man, woman, boy, girl, old woman, young woman, everybody, married woman. I mean, just please consider we need you. And then secondly, this is really an announcement and a prayer request. We haven't, uh, it's not set in stone, but I really feel led. Some of you have heard uh, to start a Saturday night service here at Lifehouse Church starting October 7th. It's going to involve sacrifice. We're already tired. There's a lot of people that when I share this, they're like, man, we're already like burdened. Can we do one more thing? Listen, today is the day of salvation. Paul said in Romans, wake up, church. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. And praise God, our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. And that's amazing. That's awesome. That's something for us to celebrate. But what I'm sobered by and what I lose sleep over is that that means so is the condemnation of those who do not. Tomorrow may not be the day of salvation. Think about if tomorrow was not the day, who you know that would be, according to God's word, condemned for eternity in hell. I'm not okay with that. And neither should you be brother and sister. And listen, I'm not trying to guilt or manipulate you with my tears, but we got a job to do. And I wanna ask you to please pray for God to make a way for us wounded and weary as we are to be who God is calling us to be a force for him if we do this we're going to need your help we're going to need you to sacrifice and for you to maybe even be willing to suffer listen I don't want anybody to be casualty of war I'm trusting that God will fill you up as you pour yourself out or otherwise I wouldn't ask you to do it I wouldn't ask you to consider it I don't want the one to be a casualty I'm just telling you we need you When you serve and when you give, it makes a difference. And when you don't, it makes a difference. So two things. Consider serving right now, not putting it off till tomorrow, letting us know that you're available. And second, pray for us about this Saturday night service. And consider what God would call you to do in light of the scripture as we close the service right now. Let's bow our heads and pray.